pastor and um, and also in lo local churches as um, as we're invited. So we're really excited to begin this journey, excited to have you um, here with me um, and to get to know each one of you a little bit better. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to jump into um, the content for this week. So that should uh, show up nicely for us there. Um, so we're beginning this week and you have your handout uh, that was was passed out. Um, we're going to just do kind of a little bit of an overview of Paul's life, what we know from scripture, um, his ministry, and uh, and then we'll get into chapter one of Ephesians, and I'll highlight some of the things that I think are really critical there and interesting uh, for you uh, as we go along. On your handout, you have kind of my outline um, of the letter of Ephesians, bullet points two and three. Basically, one, three, running through the end of chapter three are kind of like the theological argument, if you will, of the letter. This can be divided into a kind of, um, yeah, larger theological argument about the victory of God in Christ and the unity of the people of God in the spirit of Christ. And then what we call a digression, where Paul talks uh, about his being imprisoned uh, for the, the benefit of the nations, the Gentiles. And then beginning with verse uh, one of chapter four, we begin kind of the moral exhortation section of the letter, which runs all the way through uh, 620, and then you have the closing of the letter. So you've got opening greeting, body of the letter, which can be divided between uh, the kind of theological story Paul is telling, and then the moral exhortation that comes out of it. That's very important to keep in mind when you're reading Paul's letters. He never just gives you uh, commands, do this, do that, uh, moral principles, it's always rooted in the larger story. So you're always being called to live out a particular lifestyle in light of what God has done in Christ Jesus. And that's really important to get for Paul. So you've got the structure there of the letter. You've got some of the, the points that we're going to cover here tonight. And then at the bottom, you have some resources. And I'll provide new resources every week. These are some general resources that might be interesting to you. Um, I've got Lynn Kohick's commentary on Ephesians, which I think is one of the best larger commentaries written on Ephesians. I think she published it in 2020. Uh, my friend Tim Gombas wrote a really excellent book, uh, The Drama of Ephesians, which is probably my favorite book, actually, for just outlining um, kind of the story of Ephesians and how we see ourselves in it today. And there's a couple other resources I've listed there as well. Good resources for getting into study of Paul in general. I also want to draw your attention to the bottom part of the page, the resources section. Um, we've got a number of resources that we're producing at the center that I'm really excited about. We just started doing it, launched a podcast that is uh, taking people through the first series that I'm doing in the podcast is with in conversation with other scholars. We're doing a series called Why We Love Scripture. And we've, we've covered so far uh, Psalms, Ephesians, um, I'm sorry, Psalms, Isaiah, those are the two that have come out. Uh, Mark is coming out next week, and the week after that is Ephesians. So uh, this class might be interested in that. So we've got the podcast, which is, I think, really great. And then we've also got our YouTube channel, um, which is releasing short videos um, that you can use, that you can share, that, that allow you to go a little bit deeper into some of these issues that we've been talking about in class. In fact, there's two issues that I'm going to mention here briefly in this lecture that I go into greater detail in the videos, both of which I, I intentionally am releasing tomorrow. So it's a question of authorship of Ephesians and destination of Ephesians. Uh, the YouTube channel will be releasing videos on both of those tomorrow, so you may be interested in that. And then the last thing is we've got a, a Facebook group community, so if you're on Facebook, we'd love for you to join our community. This is a group that I've created just for us to encourage one another in our reading of scripture. I post prayer and scripture readings on the page, as well as other things that are happening in our community. And it's a place where you can come ask questions, dialogue, uh, that kind of thing. So it's a really great place. I've been having a lot of fun with it, and uh, we'd love to have you join us. So those are some resources that we have uh, that and we're working on producing with uh, at the center. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into uh, talking about Ephesians. Our goal, again, is just to get a brief overview of Paul's ministry, a uh, little bit about his letter writing, a little bit about the history of Ephesians, and then we're going to cover chapter one in detail, which is really, I think, a really exciting chapter uh, of Ephesians. Really good stuff here. 
So let's go ahead. The opening conversation that we we discussed in class, and I, I can remember because it's still fresh in my mind, what were some of the things that were said? I had us kind of think about um, this picture of, okay, so when we think about Paul, what are some of the ideas that come to our mind? What are some of the things that that we associate with Paul that we see that are prominent? Um, things that came up, Joni had mentioned uh, online, Paul is the imprisoned apostle, right? So he's the one who's incarcerated. And in fact, we have a series of letters, including Ephesians, that we call prison epistles, letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison or incarcerated. Um, another gentleman, Ken, mentioned Paul's a community builder. He's like a, a, a missionary kind of, and that's a really important picture of Paul. Paul's planting local church communities, uh, Christian cell groups that are associated uh, and devoted to Jesus the Messiah, and they're learning to live together uh, with one another, right? Um, so we had, those were those were a couple of, uh, of ideas that were uh, brought up. Another one that I think is prominent for a lot of people is Paul, uh, is kind of the theologian. Paul oftentimes in our uh, churches is kind of where we go for our theology. And sometimes we think of Paul almost as kind of just an abstract thinker, like he's giving us uh, theological ideas um, that are more rooted in like, oh, yeah, rigorous theological reflection, but how do they relate to everyday life? Um but in fact, when we look at the letters, Paul is very much rooted in everyday life. He's invested in these everyday communities, and he's always working with one another, uh, always working with others, right? So just as he encourages others to work together with one another in Christ Jesus, he's doing the same thing. Um, he's writing letters with other people. He is um, He's co-laboring with other people. In fact, his favorite term to really to talk about ministry is to talk about those who are my fellow workers, right? My co-laborers in Christ, my co-soldiers in the Messiah, uh, my co-prisoners in the Lord Jesus Christ. So a lot of participatory language um, that we find in Paul. So those were some of the things that we kind of highlighted at the beginning when we were looking at Paul. Uh, then provided just a brief sketch of Paul's life, what we can know. And again, just to provide a little bit of background for, uh, for the class. So Paul is basically a younger contemporary of Jesus. We know that he was just a little bit younger than Jesus based on the description that we have of him in Acts. He's introduced by Luke as a, a young man. The Greek term is neonias, which is someone in their 30s, kind of. Um, so he's born just after Jesus, sometime in the early, mid um, first, first century, right? Um, from there, we can see Paul was educated. Um, he was a diasporic Jew, meaning he did not live in the land of Israel. He lived in Tarsus, which was uh, kind of a mid-sized city in Cilicia. Um, so he would gr grew up knowing Greek. He was bicultural. He had a Hebrew name, Shaul or Saul, as well as a Greek name, Paul or Paulos. And um, he was educated in Greek language and thinking from his letters. We can tell he had, had some formal training, um, as well as educated in the Jewish scriptures. He says he was trained by the Rabbi Gamaliel, famous rabbi that we see mentioned in Acts. So he had some formal uh, training there as well. Then we see Paul the adult, kind of the next picture emerges. Paul is a Pharisee. So he's a member of a Jewish group that was committed to teaching the Torah. Um, he seems to be, a, a particularly, he mentions his zeal several times. He's particularly zealous for the law, the traditions of his ancestors. And this leads him directly into confrontation with the Jesus movement. He sees the Jesus movement as a false messianic movement, something that's dangerous for the Jewish people and something that needs to be stomped out. And so it's in his zeal for doing God's will and his desire to stomp out the Jesus movement that he's in fact confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. So Paul is the classic example of somebody that was 100% certain, committed that he was doing the Lord's work, and then he was smacked in the face with the reality that, oh my, in fact, he was going directly against God. He was persecuting the people of God. It's a good reminder for us. Sometimes we, maybe ourselves, or we see others who are gung-ho doing things for God, only later to find out that maybe we weren't always on team God in quite the way that we thought. Paul's an extreme example of that. And his transformation is seen as kind of this radical reversal of zealous persecutor of the early Jesus movement to now its greatest advocate. Now he's the Messiah, Jesus's chosen instrument to go to the nations, the Gentiles, and bring the news of the Jewish Messiah to the nations. 
So that's what he does. He goes to the Gentiles, uh, different groups, as well as Jewish groups, and he's um, starting these kind of small cells, cell groups out of synagogues and bringing together Jews and Gentiles, bringing together various Gentiles, and he's giving them uh, a story, a, a large story that they can all live in. We could think of it as the, the in Christ identity story. And that's the one that we actually see laid out really clearly for us in Ephesians chapter one. So we'll get to that in more detail. But Paul is kind of trying to provide them all a grounding narrative so that we've got different people groups living together, different stories, different traditions. And yet, they're all one people in the Messiah Jesus. That's what Paul says. And so he's he's giving us all kind of a story to live together. He's a kingdom worker. He's working with others. And part of his work is then writing letters. The letters are how he's present with the community when he's not there. Um, they're, they present his powerful presence, apostolic authority to the communities. Um, they're letters that he wrote with other Christians. This is something I like to point out. Over half of Paul's letters are directly attributed to more authors than just Paul. We've got other figures like Timothy, uh, Sosthenes, Silas, and others who Paul mentions, uh, whom Paul mentions as being his co-workers, others who are writing letters with him. And then, of course, he entrusts his letters to others to bring them. So a great example of this is he commends Phoebe, the deacon minister from the church in Cancrea in Asia Minor. He, he, uh, he commends her um, to the Romans, to bring Romans there. So she would bring the letter read the letter, answer questions about the letter. So Paul's always entrusting himself. He's writing letters in conversation with others. Um, the letters are a presentation of collective thinking, I think, in many ways among different Christian leaders. And then he's also entrusting others to bring the message when they bring the letter and to speak on his behalf um, when he's when he's not there. So we've got 13 letters of Paul. And uh, yeah, these are um, these are Paul doing theology in community, Paul doing theology rooted in the, the real mission of God that's happening on the ground. There's two quotations that I like to draw people's attention to um, when it comes to Paul's letters, and they illustrate the two points. The first is that his letters are what we call occasional documents. The idea here is that he writes his letters for particular communities, for the most part, facing particular questions or circumstances, right? And those questions aren't necessarily our questions. Uh, we could, you know, ask, ask ourselves the question, how many of us today, when we went to the store to buy meat, whether it's Costco or Safeway or uh, Walmart, wherever we buy our meat, how many of us asked ourselves when we picked up a pound of beef, uh, was this sacrifice to an idol today? right? It's probably not a question that's on our horizons. And yet it was a question that was very important, a very important pastoral question for Paul's audience. So he spends a couple chapters in 1 Corinthians talking about this issue and helping a community, a pretty confused community, reason through how they might think Christianly about this very practical issue of everyday life. So here's what Longenecker says about occasional documents. These are written in first century Greek to Jesus followers in specific first century, first century situations. Paul's letters were meant to guide particular Jesus followers who, in his view, needed theological fine tuning or at times a more radical overhaul. So some of his letters are encouraging with some theological fine tuning like Philippians. And then there's some where we have the radical overhaul. Think like Galatians and the Corinthian correspondence, right? This is more than simple fine tuning in those instances. Sending letters was his way of assisting struggling communities, trying to get them uh, to get them to think through the, to the next stage of their development, seeking to ensure that their devotion to Jesus Christ would stay focused within, within certain theological parameters before the imminent coming of their Lord. As such, Paul's letters generally engage in issues that, in his mind, were on the near horizon for Jesus groups and his own ministry. Right? So again, these are occasional documents. There are particular exigencies or circumstances that lead to Paul writing these letters, and he's focused on that immediate nature. So Paul's letters are not written to us, right? In a way, we're reading um, other people's mail, but they are scripture for us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So part of the trick with reading Paul's letters is that how do they become wisdom for us, as many of the questions we have are different than... Um, than the communities he was uh, initially addressing. 
the way that I like to think about Paul's letters, it's another quote from Longenecker that I think is really helpful, is Paul's letters are exercises in thinking the Messiah or thinking Christianly, or if you like, applying the Jesus story um, in everyday life. This is what Paul's all about. This is what drives him. This is what animates him. This is the origin of Christian theology. How does one see all of life through a Christ-shaped lens? Right. So this is what Longenecker writes. Paul, not a systematic theologian. In other words, he's not writing A, B, C, D, things we believe about God, A, B, C, D, things we believe about Jesus. That's not what he's doing. Paul was more like a pastoral theologian, teaching Jesus followers to think theologically about who they were, how their story was animated by the story of God's engagement with the world, how they were developing in their devotion to Jesus Christ, how they differed from their pagan environment all around them, and how they were to engage each other with uh, and with others beyond their corporate gatherings. Doing theology on the move, Paul was a master of pastoral theologizing in an effort to help communities of Jesus followers shape their identities in relation to a worldview of what God has already done in Christ and would bring to completion through Christ. Love that quote. Um, and I think it's a good reminder of worldview. That's a term that as Christians we use in different ways today. Oftentimes when Christian use, Christians use the term worldview in the United States, we mean kind of a series of things that Christians believe or should believe. And that's okay. There are things we should believe as Christians. But the world, the Christian worldview, as Paul has it, is actually more fundamental than that. It's less about a series of propositions and more about a whole way of seeing the world. It's again, it's about seeing the world in light of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, and learning how to apply that story to all of life. So that's the worldview. It's the the Christian lenses that you put on to see the whole world, and that becomes the the prism through which you see everything. So Paul is constantly asking communities to uh, think about the Jesus story. And then to apply the mind of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we do on our own for Paul. He says it's God working in you. That's the Spirit working in us to live out this Jesus story on a daily basis with one another. So I think that's really helpful. Um, sometimes we have this picture of Paul as a kind of abstract thinker, lone ranger, celebrity pastor, uh, ivory tower theologian, when in fact, Paul's really none of those things. Paul is a, a community organizer. He's a, a missionary pastor. He's a pastoral theologian, right? He's very practical, rooted in everyday life. Theology is always theology applied for Paul that leads to concrete behaviors in community with one another. So that's the picture of Paul uh, that I want us to take with us into the letter to Ephesians. I think that's the picture of Paul that we see emerge in the letter uh, to the Ephesians. Okay, a few uh, critical issues now when it comes to Ephesians. These are things that if you read scholarship on Ephesians, you're inevitably going to come across all of these issues. So if you pick up a commentary, a kind of in-depth discussion of the letter, th these issues will be discussed. And because the Center of Bible Study is committed to doing uh, you know, in-depth, rigorous historical but bib biblical studies. Uh, we don't back away from any of these critical issues, and we talk about them together, and we try to think through them theologically together. So I didn't spend a lot of time in class talking about the authorship issue. That's a, a point that I actually uh, discuss in more detail on the video that's being released on YouTube tomorrow. You can find it on the YouTube channel in your handout. But I'll say a couple things here. I do think Paul wrote Ephesians. Uh, within scholarship, there's six of the 13 letters that are disputed, meaning not all scholars believe that Paul wrote them. And Ephesians is in that camp for reasons that I describe in the letter. I'm pretty convinced that Paul did write Ephesians, um, whether he himself hand wrote it. Many of his letters he didn't. He had a scribe write it, and he writes in con con uh, in community and dialogue with others. So we, we don't have a picture of Paul as like lone, isolated author. That's not the picture of Paul that we get from the letters. That's really not the picture of ancient writing in, in, in general. So we, we think about Paul as author working with others, perhaps dictating the letter, perhaps authorizing parts of the letter to be written um, while he's in prison. Uh, something like that's probably going on to my mind. Um, so you can watch more of the video. And if you have questions about that, please send me an email or we can discuss them in the next class. The one that I did spend a little bit of time in class on, there's also a video coming out on this issue uh, that you can watch if you're interested in it, is the destination of Ephesians. Because it just so happens that our earliest manuscripts don't actually have an Epheso in Ephesus. Uh, 
um, in in uh, in the manuscript. And I'll show you those examples here in a moment. And then the third one that I just briefly touched on, just so we, we recognize there's different uh, theories out there, is where we place Ephesians, where we date it in Paul's ministry. Okay, so again, the authorship question is a, is a important one. It's a it's a pretty um, it needs to be a nuanced conversation. And so I didn't want to take up too much class time. So again, I'm releasing that video to give you a little bit more of my thoughts on it. And I'd encourage you to watch it if you have questions to ask me about it. But I'm going to kind of presuppose that Paul did write Ephesians for the purpose of this class, so that we can focus on what I take to be more important issues. In terms of the destination, right? So we we have here, um, these are our earliest uh, uh, attested readings. Uh, P46, which is uh, the first collection we have of Paul's letters, it dates to about 200 AD. This top bullet point reading is from P46. And you can see that the, the, the destination here is absent. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God to the holy ones who are who, who are what, right? So it's not there. Um, it's probably an error here that was left out. Something's missing. Um, but you do have some church fathers like Origen, who makes a really big deal about this reading, which is what he has. The holy ones who are, and he makes a big deal about Christians are in fact the ones who really exist because they exist in Christ. So you have a, a way of, uh, he has a, a way of reading this as uh, spiritually edifying, but likely this is not uh, the original reading, or if it is, we have to explain it, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, another possibility, which is intriguing, is uh, the second century church father Tertullian mentions that the heretic Marcion, uh, Marcion was a uh, second century heretic, basically in a nutshell, he believed that the God of Jesus Christ, the Christian God, was a different God than the God of wrath that we find in the Old Testament. So if you've ever heard before, and sometimes maybe even in church, you've heard this idea that God in the Old Testament is a God of wrath, God in the New Testament is a God of love. That's sort of like Marcion light. Uh, that's an idea that's been around since the second century. Uh, the church has deemed that a not appropriate way of talking about the one God of scripture. So this Marcion, according to Tertullian, mentions that this the letter to Ephesians is in fact reads has a reading to the holy ones who are in Laodicea, and that's interesting because Laodicea is the neighboring town next to Colossae, and we know that Ephesians and Colossians are connected together. I put in your folder a synopsis comparing Ephesians and Colossians; they're clearly related to one another. I think Paul wrote the two at the same time, or made use of Colossians writing Ephesians just after that. They're clearly related uh, to one another. And so, and at the end of Colossians, he tells the church in, church in Colossae to exchange letters with the church that he wrote to the Laodiceans. So he says, you make a copy, you, you Colossians make a copy of the letter that I wrote to you and give it to the Laodiceans. And you have a copy of the letter I sent to them and you read it. Uh, so is it just possible that Ephesians was originally written to that city, Laodicea? It's possible. Uh, the majority reading does have uh, the holy ones who are in Ephesus, and this is what you would see in your English Bible. But I just point out that our earliest manuscripts, I mentioned P46. The other one is Codex Sinaiticus, 4th century manuscript, very important. It does have in Ephesus in it, but it's a later scribal edition. So you can see in the margins, a scribe wrote in Ephesus where it was uh, missing. Either the scribe's probably correcting it against another manuscript, but the copy that was used to make um, Codex Sinaiticus obviously didn't have in Ephesus in it, or at least likely didn't. So come back to then, how do we think of, how do we think about the destination of Ephesians? There's a, there's a couple possibilities, right? I think three possibilities. One is it really was originally sent to the Ephesians, that that then dropped out of the manuscript tradition. We have some of our earliest manuscripts have scribal error in them, and in, in FSO gets added back in, so kind of correcting what was original. Other possibilities are, and some scholars suggest that Ephesians was an encyclical letter. So the reason that we don't have a destination here, the holy ones who are, is because the original copy was made so that you could plug in various cities as Ephesians, 
was being read in some of those churches uh, around uh, in the Lycus Valley. I'll show you a map in a minute. There's a, a ring of churches there. So this, we get the idea of encyclical letter or circular letter. Or the other possibility is that uh, Marcion in this case was right. He was right on the minor details, wrong on the big stuff, but right that this Ephesians was originally written to the church in uh, Laodicea. It doesn't matter so much for our interpretation of the letter. The one place that I'm cautious, because Ephesians is a very broad letter, it seems to be written more generally. Paul doesn't greet any individuals in Ephesus, which is odd because he spent years doing ministry there. Um, I think it's it's helpful to read Ephesians kind of more broadly, generally, rather than trying to find, let's say, a specific issue in the city of Ephesus that explains the reason for the letter. That's a route that I don't take because I'm not fully confident that, uh, that the, it, Ephesus was, in fact, the destination there. And even if it was, I don't see how the letter is targeting, in particular, uh, a specific Ephesians issue. It seems to be a bit more broad, uh, a bit more general. On this slide, which you have the my uh, you have PDFs of the PowerPoints, so if you want to check these out online, this link this first link will take you to P46. It, fair warning, it's in Greek, but um, you know it gives you a shot of what the Greek text looks like there. This one might be more helpful. The the next one it takes you to the website for Codex Sinaiticus. You can copy and paste it in, and that actually does provide an English translation next to it. So you can see the Greek and you can see the English next to it. And if you zoom in, it lets you zoom the the um, the image in. You'll see um, the scribal writing and Epheso in Ephesus in the margins there. So you can check that out. It's kind of fun. Okay, so a little bit about the destination. We have to be a little bit loose with the original uh, intended audience of Ephesians. Could be an encyclical letter, could be a different city, could be Ephesus. There are various possibilities. In terms of when Ephesians was written, so first off, uh, we know that Ephesians is connected, clearly connected with Colossians and, uh, and Philemon. The same letter bearer, Tychicus, is mentioned at the end of Colossians, uh, as mentioned in Ephesians. Um, the ending, the part where Ephesians and Colossians agree verbatim. The uh, 40 some words in Greek is at the end. So these letters are clearly connected. They go together. We've got a cluster here with Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon that uh, Paul wrote. So where did he write these letters? Um, they're all the prison letters along with Philippians. These are what we call the prison epistles. Paul was imprisoned at various times in his ministry. The Typical answer is we go to Acts, and we know that in Acts, at the end of the book, Paul was imprisoned in Rome for two years from 60 to 62, and so scholars will place, uh, often place Ephesians there, or they might say, well, Paul was also in prison before he was transferred to Rome, first in Jerusalem, then he's transferred to Caesarea Maritime, uh, which is the seat of where the, the Roman governor of the province of Judea was situated, so Paul was, was held there. Um, both of those are put forward. I tend to think that Ephesians was probably written earlier on in Paul's ministry. In fact, I think all of this this whole cluster of letters, Colossians, Philipp, uh, Philemon, Ephesians, was written earlier in Paul's ministry. That might be a minority position, but it's one many scholars are coming to. There's nothing in these letters that show Paul's direct connection yet to these communities. And yet we know from Acts that he actually spent years in Ephesus uh, where he had direct contact with large groups from all of Asia Minor. And so it makes more sense to my mind to place this cluster of letters in a period where Paul's imprisoned in that area, perhaps in Ephesus or some other surrounding city. He's imprisoned there, and he's writing to some of these places that he actually hasn't had direct contact with um, yet. So we see that also in... Um, in Colossians. Paul Paul doesn't know the Colossians face to face. He says that. He knows them through one of his associates. So anyway, I, I tend to lean towards an earlier date that Ephesians was probably written in the early mid-50s when Paul was in prison there. We know he, he was in prison many times, as he mentions in his letters. So Acts is just kind of probably the tip of the iceberg for his um, the times that he was imprisoned. So, so that's kind of where I fall in dating the letter. Okay, so now let's move into uh, the good stuff, the, the real important stuff. Oh, yeah, first off, this is just a picture or a map you can see here of Asia Minor. Um, so you can see, let's see if I can get my mouse here. Aha, yes. You can see Colossae is right here. Here's where we have Ephesus, right? Uh, Colossae here, Laodicea here. So when Paul is telling them to 
exchange letters. These are the neighboring cities that are exchanging letters. If we think of Ephesians as an encyclical letter, then we're thinking of uh, it being written so that it could be read, you know, transcribed and read in this kind of ring of churches. These are also the ring of churches that are addressed in the seven letters in Revelation, right? So we have them uh, show up there as well. Okay, so this is the area that we're talking about. All right, so some things about uh, Ephesians that I think are really important to foreground in our study. Ephesians is that's probably my favorite letter of Paul, and I think it gives us a really wonderful picture of the expanse of the gospel, really clarity that the gospel for Paul is theocentric, meaning it's it's really not about human beings first and foremost. It's about what God has done in Christ. God, uh, the Father, uh, by the Messiah, the Son, Jesus, uh, or through the Messiah, by the by the Messiah, through the Holy Spirit. So it's it's about, uh, it's a cosmic theocentric story about what God does, and it calls and it summons the cosmos or creation, summons us into participation. And I think it's important that we begin there. Sometimes we begin with the gospel uh, at kind of an anthropological level, me and God, uh, my relationship with God, how God saves me. That's all good, but recognize that that part fits within this larger story, and Ephesians helps us helps us see that. So the first thing that Ephesians helps us do, and I think is really important in our um, American individualistic, hyper-individualistic society, if Ephesians holds together the individual and the corporate, right? Again, we tend to oftentimes focus on the individual, my relationship with God, me and Jesus, me and my Bible. Uh, again, all of that is good. But from Paul's perspective, we begin with the larger story. We begin with the corporate. We begin with the recognition that we are all drawn together in the Messiah Jesus, that we're part of one body. And then when we think about our identity as individuals, we think of ourselves as body members linked together with other body members or uh, parts, pieces of a temple that's being built up in Christ Jesus. So it's this larger picture. Paul is always thinking about the body collective in Jesus, and it's out of that reflection that individuals can then reason. But it, it begins with the larger scope, and the individual finds itself within that, that larger picture. So we don't need to dichotomize the two, but in terms of priority, the individual finds its priority or finds itself within this larger story. I think the second thing that Ephesians helps us see really clearly is what we've oftentimes struggled with as Protestants, the dichotomy sometimes between faith and works. Paul moves so naturally in Ephesians 2 from 8 and 9. It's the gift of God, the grace of God by which we're saved, uh, not by works, so that no one might boast. We're, we're, we're saved by grace through faith, and that leads directly into a discussion of works, of good works. The good works are the things that the Spirit produces in us so that when we come to Christ, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're energized by the Spirit, and we're, 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 we're made to do the works that Paul says God had destined for us to walk in from eternity past. So we're learning to become our new creational selves, uh, to live the way we will live for all eternity with God in a renewed, restored creation. That's where good works fits. It's the beginning of that journey. So Paul is very pro uh, good works. They have their fit in this place. The, the spirit is efficacious. We're empowered to live out the Christian life together. So we don't need to dichotomize the two. It's all gift. It's grace. God graces us, gifts us, and empowers us so that we might walk and live a, 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 and be as, uh, as truly human beings um, in the image of God. And then thirdly, this is another one that really excites me. Paul helps us see that we some that this dichotomy we sometimes created between the spiritual and the mundane doesn't work. Paul's letter to the Ephesians is often highlighted as a the letter about spiritual warfare. In particular, the text we'll talk about in week four, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, is the classic spiritual warfare text, right? Put on the armor of God. Well, in fact, when we read Ephesians, we see that the whole letter is really about spiritual warfare. The same cosmic forces that Jesus is enthroned over, they show up throughout the letter. Um, and so we can see that, and 6, 10 through 17 is kind of at this end of this letter. It's not a new message. It's kind of the capstone piece of the whole 
of the whole letter. So Ephesians is about spiritual warfare. But then when we read Ephesians, right, in light of that, what we see is that Paul is really focused on how we love one another well on a daily basis, how we maintain unity in the spirit. So what this suggests, I think, really clearly for Paul is that, yeah, we are engaged in spiritual warfare together, and the battle is primarily over how are we going to love each other? How are we going to live together? How are we going to maintain the bond of unity that Jesus has brought about in his crucified body by, and, and that's uh, our unity in the Holy Spirit? It's practical, everyday stuff, right? So mundane love, everyday love is really the, the ground on which spiritual warfare is waged for Paul. And I think that's a really helpful frame because while we can think of spiritual warfare in more particular ways, uh, maybe encountering in, in more palpable ways, um, malicious forces, uh, demonic spirits, or something like that. Um, that's a, an element or a facet of the larger cosmic battle that's taking place for Paul uh, in, in the story that Paul tells. And I think, we, we again, we want to start with that big picture so we get a sense of what Paul is doing and, and everything else fits in that. So I love Ephesians for that because it really helps us get this big picture of the gospel and everything else, I think, fits within Okay, so let's now turn towards Ephesians 1. We're going to take it in, uh, in three sections here. The first is we begin with the greeting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, through the will of God to the holy ones who are, and I'll read in Ephesus here, uh, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So this is the opening greeting of Paul kind of a common greeting for Paul. And yet, I think it tells us a lot already. There's a lot of theology packed into the greeting. We see Paul's identity here. So Paul is an apostle. The term apostolos um, could be a pretty generic term, right? If I send you uh, as my authoritative messenger, you're my apostle, right? So this term is taken up in the New Testament in a couple of ways. You have a more particular way uh, or a more restricted way, let's say, in the Gospels and in Acts, where the 12, the representatives that Jesus chooses to signify the reconstitution of Israel, the 12 are called apostles. All right, so that's a more restrictive sense. Paul also uses apostle in a bit of a broader sense. Those who are in the community who were with Jesus in his ministry and are recognized as kind of authoritative figures on Jesus' tradition. Paul mentions in Romans 16, Junia, the woman Junia, and Andronicus, these are probably husband and wife, as being prominent among the apostles. So these are two that Paul recognizes as prominent, well-known among the apostles, a wider group in the church who are recognized as being with Jesus and... Um, yeah, knowing him in his earthly ministry and authorized by Jesus and the community to uh, to speak about what Jesus said and did, right? And then within that, Paul is kind of a special case in that Paul's apostleship begins with the Damascus Road experience, where he's called and confronted by the risen Christ, and it's in that moment that he's tr he's transformed from the persecutor of the church to now the apostle to the, to the nations. Israel and the diaspora and the, the Gentiles. Uh, that's what he's he's called to. And later in his letters, he comes to describe that as a prophetic call. The Lord set me apart from my mother's womb um, uh, when he was pleased to reveal himself to me in me. Uh, that's, that was the beginning of the calling of Paul's apostolic ministry. So Paul is the he's, he's his apostle of Christ Jesus. He's the one sent by Christ Jesus, and it is through the will of God. We're already beginning to see distinction here within our understanding of God's identity. We have God the Father, uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son, the Messiah, and also this, the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to show up in verse 1 as well. So this is a bit about Paul's identity. Then the addressee's identity, right? What Paul says about his addressees, what, what the text is saying about us today is so important for us to grasp. It's easy to gloss over Paul calling people saints and holy ones. But what is he saying here? He's saying that God's Holy Spirit has indwelt us, has marked us, has claimed us, has sanctified us so that we are holy to offer ourselves to God. Holiness is both an identity marker. It's something God gives to us by stamping us with the Holy Spirit, claiming us as his, 
and it's a vocational calling. It's what we're called to do as we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live out our Christian identity. So our holiness is both our identity in Christ and a vocation as we live by the Spirit. Paul also describes them as faithful, right? This is a common term. Those who are faithful, allegiant to the Messiah Jesus. That's what knits us all together. Different groups of people coming together who are allegiant to the one King Jesus. So that's how Paul identifies the addressees. And through the text, that's how we are also addressed today. Holy and faithful ones in Christ Jesus. And then God's identity comes out really clearly in the opening of Ephesians. Ephesians uh, opens through a theocentric lens. It's focused on what God is doing. God the Father working through the Son, uh, Jesus the Messiah, by the Holy Spirit. Right, so this is the God is the director, the the primary actor in this cosmic drama, and we're going to be drawn into that in the um, in this opening blessing and prayer, and that's that's like lays the foundation for the rest of the letter. Right? So what we did in class was we had people read through. Um, read through the blessing. And what was fun is we had people read different translations. And so some of the translations read quite differently. Some of them even um, added things into the text for interpretive purposes. So we talked a little bit about how various English translations have different theories. Some are kind of more wooden and try to re represent word for word. And then others are more thought for thought, right? The different kind of theory about how translation should look. And some even go a bit beyond thought for thought and add a little bit of interpretation in the text to try to help people in our culture understand what the text is uh, is communicating. So I'm going to read for from you my translation. This is just kind of my working from uh, from the Greek text, so it's not going to read exactly like uh, your English translation, but again, you can kind of compare um, how it sounds. So this is the blessing, and I'm going to read it kind of in one shot because this is actually one sentence in the Greek. Uh, one single sentence. English doesn't tolerate this kind of writing. You know, we're taught by our English teachers, write short, succinct sentences, connect things, use conjunctions, logical connections, uh, all of this. And Greek can do that as well, but Greek also allows for the stacking of clause after clause after clause. And they kind of get these undulating clauses and this extended blessing as Paul tells this story. So I'm going to read it in one shot so that you can kind of get uh, get a hearing maybe of a little bit what it might sound like. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, one who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let me just pause right there. Um, the whole blessing you're going to notice is structured by the phrase in Christ, in him, in the beloved one. So everything is uh, it's all oriented around in Christ identity. Um, so it's not just, we talk, you know, we talk about God's choosing. You'll see here it talks about God's um, predestining from all eternity past, right? These decisions, it's the particular nature of the decision. It's in Christ, in him, in the beloved one. All right. So let me, uh, we'll, go, we'll start from the top again. Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him from the foundation of the world to be that we might be uh, holy and blameless before him in love, having set us apart or predestined us for adoption through Christ Jesus in him, unto him. Uh, according to uh, the good pleasure of his will, for the praise of his glo uh, the glory of his grace, which he graced us in the beloved one, in whom we uh, have received the ransom or redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and knowledge, making known to us or disclosing to us the mystery of his will in accordance, again, accordance with his good pleasure, which he set in advance in him. 
in order for the uh, the economy, the disposition uh, of the fullness of time. So this is a marking off of the distinct period, uh, the fullness of time, that all things might be summed up in the Messiah, or to sum up, I should say, to sum up all things in the Messiah, things in the heavens and things on earth in him. In him also, we were called having been set apart according to his uh, decision, a predecision, uh, uh, the predecision of the one who works all things uh, according to the counsel of his will, in order that we might be for the praise of his glory, the first who are the ones who hoped in advance in the Messiah Jesus. In him also you, Right? So we've got a us in a you, in him also you, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in which you also trusting were sealed by the Holy Spirit, uh, the promised Holy Spirit, which is the arabon, the deposit of, of our inheritance for the, again, redemption or ransom of of the possession or God's possession that he purchases us as his possession for the praise of his glory, right? That's all one sentence in Greek. So a lot going on there. We talk about, you know, we talked in class a bit about like what strikes you in this passage. And I encourage you read it over several times, kind of meditate on it. Think about what's, what do you find striking here? What's sticking out to you? Um, a few things that I think are critical to notice, right? We already mentioned in him, everything is structured around being in Christ. So the in Christ identity is like the marker that holds it all together, right? It's the work that God is doing in Christ. It's the identity that we have in Christ. That's like central to everything Paul is doing here. And another thing that sticks out that we talked about, and I think it pops out clearly, is how much language of will and decision making on the part of God we see present here, right? And the idea here is, yeah, we can get into debates about predestination and how that works, but I think that's kind of secondary to what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying that all of us, as we find ourselves in the Messiah Jesus, we find ourselves here not by accident. This was God's eternal eternal purpose, that we would find ourselves in Christ Jesus. We being both Paul and other Jews and Gentiles, all of us together by the same Holy Spirit are in Christ Jesus. In fact, if you look at Paul's predestination language in his letters, it always revolves around these conversations about what is God doing with the Jewish people? How does that relate to the nations? And Paul uses, I think, predestination language here to show it how we're all meant to be together in the Messiah, right? It's, per it's the particular choice that God chose us to be in Christ. And that's where we find our identity. That's where we're found. So it's it's focused on, again, this gospel announcement of what God has done in Christ, and and, and our then comes our response to that gospel message that Jesus, that God has acted and been victorious in Christ, and we're then brought in uh, to the people of God. So very theocentric, Father, Son, and Spirit are the ones acting in the drama of salvation, and we're brought up or we're swept up into that. That's the cosmic story that we all find ourselves in, and that's where Paul starts when he's thinking about what does it mean to be a Christian. So that gives us a little bit about the passage. Think about other things in the structure that might stand out to you. But that's the foundational story that Paul is telling. That's where we find ourselves. I also focused a little bit on class on some of the language of the spirit here. I think it's really powerful what Paul does at the end of this blessing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Holy Spirit. So he speaks of the spirit in a couple of ways. Uh, one is as in, in financial terms. He uses the Semitic terms transliterated into Greek, arabon which is a deposit. So it's a something that's that's set down, uh, a deposit that's made for the fullness of the possession. The idea is that God purchased us in Christ Jesus. You can think about 1 Corinthians 6, you were bought with a price. This is the redemption price or the ransom price of being purchased out of slavery to sin. God bought us and and this the spirit dwelling with us now is uh is the deposit of the full inheritance we will have at the resurrection, right? The redemption of the possession, uh, which happens at the resurrection when Jesus returns.
So that's one image that Paul uses. Another image is the, the language of sealing, that when we trust, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And this is brought up for many interpreters, um, kind of a, a an analogy to circumcision, right? That is circumcision is the, the, the sign and seal of the covenant. So too, being sealed by the Spirit is, is like a spiritual circumcision. Um, Paul kind of goes there in Colossians, which is parallel to Ephesians. So there's some merit to that. Another image that I think is really interesting for Ephesians is the language of seal that ancient authors talk about when they use their insignia, their, the wax sealing of, uh, of a document, right? You have your particular seal, which is you placing your stamp of authority, your identity, your ownership on that thing. And when some ancient authors like Cicero talk about putting their seal on something, they're they're saying they're they're putting their very self on that thing. They're identifying with that thing. That thing is marked by them, and I think that's really helpful for thinking about what it means that God pours out the Holy Spirit on us. God is marking us as His own. God is identifying us as His very own, just as a um, as a wax tablet would be sealed by an ancient writer. So we move from God's eternal decision that we might be drawn together in the Messiah Jesus, uh, a discussion about the redemption that's brought about through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus so that all things might be restored and summed up in him. And then Paul moves from a, a, um, a we to a you. And we see, as we read in chapter two, the we and the you dynamic seems to be we Jews and you Gentiles together are being brought into uh, into the Messiah Jesus. So really powerful stuff here. This is the opening blessing. Um, Paul will open his letters typically with some kind of prayer, uh, which has in it theology that's going to come out throughout the whole letter. And that's what you, you have here in this blessing. And then in the prayer that follows, you have Paul kind of laying the groundwork of the theology that's going to come out uh, through the letter. So when you want to think about your identity of being in Christ, this is the place to start, right? Think about what God has done in Christ Jesus and how you, by the grace of God, not by your own doing, by the grace of God and by his eternal plan, you find yourself in the Messiah Jesus and it's for his glory. We respond in praise and thanksgiving for the fact that God, by his grace, has drawn us, uh, by, his, by his son, has drawn us to be part of the one people of God. So it leads to, yeah, it leads to our glory in the Messiah Jesus. And ultimately, we give it all back to God um, uh, in praise. So that's a, a little bit about the blessing. If you have any further questions about that, feel free to shoot me an email. Happy to discuss it over email with you and even maybe even to, to circle back next class. Let me say a few things then about the, the prayer. I'll, again, I'll read it to you, just kind of doing my... My wooden translation out of English, uh, out of Greek, so just so you can get um, a sense, a, a different sense of how it might uh, sound, a, another translation, as it were. Um, and then we'll talk about a few things here, I think, that are important that are going on. So he says, therefore, all right, so it's this clear transition, diatuta, which is a clear transition from the, um, the blessing. Now we're moving to something else. Here we're moving from blessing to prayer. Uh, therefore, I also... When I heard about the faith that's work, uh, the fa your faith uh, in uh, the Lord Jesus and the love that you have towards all the holy ones, I did not cease giving thanks on behalf of you, remembering you in my prayers. Uh, in order and in order that so here now we get uh, Paul's ask, like what is he praying that God would do for them? This is verse seventeen transitions into Paul now relaying to them what he is he's petitioning God for on their behalf that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of glory might give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation uh, by in the knowledge of him um having your eyes the eyes of your heart enlightened right the eyes of your heart enlightened in order that you might know what is the hope of of his calling, what is the riches of his glory of his inheritance among the holy ones, and what is the surpassing uh, um, greatness of his power among you, among us? Sorry, among us who believe or who trust 
according to the outworking and the energy of his great power, his mighty power. There's two different words for power that are stacked up here in the Greek. Um, so Paul is, is praying now for um, for spiritual enlightenment, right? For them to know the great power of God that is at work among uh, among the community. And you think about it, it, it makes sense. The more that we recognize the fullness of the hope we have in God, right? The more we are motivated and empowered by the Spirit to continue to live out um, our Christian vocation. And he transitions seamlessly from this. So he talks about this, this outworking of God's power that's there. He says, this or which he put into effect in the Messiah, raising him from the dead, seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the power that's at work in the community is the resurrection power that God put into effect in Christ Jesus. The language Paul's use, Paul uses here is like, God is this all-powerful uh, God, right? And he has the power to do it. And it's in the resurrection that he puts this power into effect. And this is the same power by the Spirit that's at work in the community. Paul mentions resurrection power here and in his prayer at the end of chapter 3. So he's got we got prayer at all the transition points in Ephesians. And this, the theme is the same, the resurrection power of God at work in the community. But this is like the founding event, right, of God's power that's put into effect effect. It's the resurrection exaltation of Jesus to the right hand of God. Um, and he puts him above every uh, every ruler and authority and power and lord, lordship, uh, and every name that is named, he says, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he subjected all things under his feet, and he gave him, he made him the head um, above all, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who, uh, the fullness or that that which is made full, uh, that filled, uh, the one who fills all things at all places or all times. So um, that's, that's that's the end of the prayer. So we, we, we move from Paul praying for this um, spiritual insight, apocalyptic insight, of what God is, what God is up to. What's the full kind of um, nature of our calling in Christ Jesus? And then he he kind of shines a spotlight on the big event, the resurrection and uh, enthronement of Jesus. And we we see here Jesus is enthroned, and the language that's used here at the right hand of God. So drawing on Psalm one hundred and ten one, which is the it's the most use Old Testament text in the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And this is being read alongside the other text Paul quotes here, Psalm 8, about the Son of Man. You subjected all things under his feet. This is the text about humanity collectively, but Jesus here as the Messiah is kind of like the head of a new humanity. So Psalm 8 is read messianically along with Psalm 110.1 as the one who's given all authority. All things are subjected under his feet. He's seated in the highest uh, heavens. Notice the figures here that, that, that he's uh, exalted over. These various authorities and rulers, these are spiritual entities that we're going to see show up throughout the letter. And so when they show up again in the spiritual warfare text, we see that it's not a new theme. These are the ones Paul's been seated over. I'm uh, sorry, that, G, that Paul says Jesus has been exalted over from the beginning. They show up again in chapter three when he says that the church collective is the sign of God's victory and announcement to these rulers and powers that their time of dividing humanity is over. So this is the kind of cosmic drama, cosmic warfare of Jesus conquering um, these, these entities, right? We might think of them as, yeah, kind of divine powers in some sense, not God. There's one God, but sub, you know, uh, divine powers, maybe angelic beings. Paul doesn't really um, get into that too much. He more describes them as these, these dark spiritual forces uh, in the heavenly places who have sought to divide humanity. And so what God wants to do is to unite humanity in Christ Jesus. And, and so that's where the, the battle takes place, right? God is uh, undoing the division that these powers and authorities have sown over God's creation, and he's drawing us together in Christ Jesus. So we see at the end of this exaltation, exaltation, 
uh, above these powers and authorities. That's where uh, where Paul goes. And of course, then he gets into the final thing we'll talk about real briefly, the head body metaphor, which is going to show up uh, more in detail in chapter five when it gets to marriage. And we'll talk about head there more and how we make sense of this metaphor. I imagine that might be one of the trickier parts of the class because people have various ideas of how to how to make sense of this. And I'll certainly give you my take and uh, be open to hearing yours as well. Um, but here, right, head body connect he's focused on the connection of um of christ to the people by the spirit and really he's presenting the church as a new a political organism by politics here i don't mean like democrats versus republicans right those categories don't exist our politics don't exist in the ancient world but politics more broadly thinking about how people live together collectively and under whose authority they live so the last thing i'll share with you is a couple of quotations uh, to illustrate the political nature of body discourse and its natural place within the ancient world. Paul's using here imagery that would really deeply resonate with his audience uh, as he's speaking about a new kind of community, an alternative kind of uh, community, a political community. This is from the philosopher Seneca, a uh, younger contemporary of Paul, so he was born a bit, bit after Paul. Seneca was a tutor of Nero, so we're going to see him in the next quote uh, address the emperor directly. But this first quotation, Seneca says, We are the parts of one great body. Our relations with one another are like a stone arch, which would collapse if the stones did not mutually support each other, and which is upheld in this very way. So thinking about a collective community as being an organic body, right, that's knit together, um, for, from Paul's perspective, that is the church. We're knit together by the Holy Spirit. We're this organic community that lives and moves and breathes through the life that the head gives the body. And the, the, the movement from body to building or body to edifice here, a stone arch, is also one Paul makes in uh, in Ephesians, in chapter two, at the end of chapter two, he's going to describe us as a new temple that's being built together and constructed together, right? So all of the stones of the temple need to be there for the uh, for this building to to be to be held together, right? So these are ways about Paul speaks about us as a political community, a, a community living under the lordship of Jesus, living together in a distinct way. A couple more for you. This is again Seneca. The Commonwealth needs the head, here talking about the emperor as the head of the Commonwealth. And then uh, extrapolating a bit on that, the gentleness of your mind, O emperor, so addressing Nero directly, the gentleness of your mind, O emperor, will be transmitted to others. It will be diffused over the whole body of the empire and will be formed in your likeness for, 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 for uh, health springs from the head. Right? So see this organic connection between the head body. Christ is the, the Lord, the ruler over the church. And it's from his life, his, his, uh, his, his self-giving nature that life is given to the body. So this is also a place that's distinct about the head body imagery that Paul makes use of. In Paul's metaphor, the head gives itself for the body. The head dies for the body. So rather than the body kind of sticking itself out there to protect the head, the head dies for the body, that the body would have life. And then the head empowers the body by through the connection of the mind and the spirit, the body's empowered to perform the same actions as the head. So when Paul says, uh, you have the mind of Christ or take on the same mindset of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is the kind of thing that Paul is getting after that the, the body is supposed to perform in the same way that the, that the head did. But life and, and, and uh, yeah, the source of life for the body is the head. So Paul's after this new, uh, this new kind of community that's being formed in Christ. And that's where we end in chapter one. We move from an expansive story about God drawing people together to a united people, Jew and Gentile brought together to be this one people in the Messiah. That's a point he's going to get into in more detail in chapter two. And we're this one body that gets its life from the head and is lives out uh, as the head did. We live out that same vocation here on earth. So some really cool stuff. Ephesians one is, I mean, I, I have trouble, uh, you know, not getting chills running down my spine every time I read the opening blessing and prayer of Ephesians one, uh, because it's all there. 
the gospel drama is all there. And it's from there that Paul's going to build, like, what's our identity in Christ? How are we to live out together? So next week, we'll jump into chapters two and three, and we'll spend all of class just Park there, chapters two and three. So if you want to read those two chapters before coming to class uh, and be, be prepared with questions and notes, that's great. If you'd prefer, um, or you just don't have time either way, to just come freshly to two and three, that's great too. It's totally up to you. And again, as I said to those who are in class, this is this class is for you. So if there are particular questions that you have, uh, please do send them to me. I want to make sure that I'm um, that I'm serving you well and that you're getting what you need out of this class. So send me your questions, comments, anything of, of that nature. I'd be happy to dialogue with you. Uh, happy to jump on uh, a Zoom call here or there if schedules permit to have additional conversations as well. Uh, I hope this is a rich time for you to really dive deeply into the riches of, of Paul's letter to the Ephesians or you know, in light of our conversation to whomever was originally uh, written. So that's where we leave off. Again, I'm so sorry for the recording tonight. This will not be a problem moving forward. I'll make sure we get a new classroom. Thanks so much for all your patience uh, tonight and uh, particularly sorry to our, our online participants. This will be the only time you hear just from me. All right. Blessings and bye for now.